All right. Well, good morning, everybody. How are we doing? All right. My name is Chris Pleckenpole, and I'm uh, the lead pastor here at Wells Branch Community Church. And if this is your first time, we welcome you. We are so glad uh, that you're here and you came at a perfect time because we're right in the middle of a series called Margin. And what we're talking about when we're saying margin, we're specifically looking at a narrow focus of margin with our time and margin with our money. And um, we define margin, the distance between our load, you know, what we're carrying, what we're, you know, the amount of bills we have to pay, the amount of time that we have, our load and our limit, our capacity. And whenever we get, whenever our load gets past our limit, we get stressed, we get anxiety, and we get very frustrated, right? And uh, over the, the past several weeks, we've been talking uh, specifically about our finances. And um, has anybody else had up-tempo conversations with your spouse over finances the past couple weeks? Anybody else? Just us? Okay. Okay, I got, I got a couple of people. I had some up-tempo conversations. Uh, and, you know, you get a little, like the beat gets a little faster. Your heart starts getting a little going. And maybe you even sing a little louder when you're talking. Um, and so what, what happens is it's because... Um, what, what happens for the most part is um, we have saver nerd types who married uh, spender free spirit types. Anybody else have this marriage? And what happens is when you have that marriage, uh, there's different value and priorities of how things should be spent, which sometimes leads to a little friction and a little conflict. Because both of these people, whether you are the... Uh, the uh, nerd saver type or you are the spender free spirit type you and there's a tendency uh for us to have anxiety and here's why here's why you have anxiety as a free spirit spender type when um you are let's just put it over here you are you're consumeristic sort of like i am driven to consume and it's not that you're you, you need to consume it's just that you want it and you want it now like when there's a sale it's like you made money right and so, like, when you kind of experience that, you're like, no, no, you don't understand. We're going to need this, so I might as well get it now at this incredible deal, right? And I need it, and I need it now. And so I want what I want when I want it. On the other side, uh, we have uh, the world of savers. And what happens with savers is there's this tendency, um, you know, you've, you've seen people like this, to hoard. It's like, it's not that you're going to be a prepper, although you might, and go off grid, and you're going to live in some, you know, bunker somewhere uh, with all of your uh, MREs that you saved up from the army. I'm not saying that anybody's doing that, but it's possible. The reality is that you could find yourself when your trust goes from God to your reserves or your, your money or your stash or your stuff, the sa- it's the same problem that a consumer has. It's just a delayed sort of reaction of fear and greed that kind of c- compromises the saver to become a hoarder. In fact, the only difference... The thing that makes, um, that moves a saver to a hoarder is your attitude towards things. When your security is in your stuff and in your money, that's a hoarder. When your security in savings is ultimately in God, that's a person that is wisely saving money. Okay, so we get that. We get that. And we said that last week that um, we need to have different lenses on, that we need Christ-centered lenses where Jesus is always at the forefront of our vision. And that is what helps us to be anxiety-free because both the extremes of being a hoarder or even being a, uh, a consumer will drive you to anxiety. Now, and we said last week that, that I kind of left you with this principle of give, save, live. I said, you know, like, look, we're going to give first, we're going to save, and then we're going to live. And all within this thing of margin. And then, <clears throat> so just in case you didn't know this, we're following uh, Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University. Did you guys know we have 225 people in Financial Peace? It's pretty exciting uh, across the board. And we are, I mean, people are, yeah, you clap for that. Uh, and I've gotten a ton of reports of people saying, like, we're going to be debt-free by May. We're going to be debt-free by next year. Uh, this has been so freeing because I now know how to give all my money a name. Uh, and so, and there's a sense of feeling like there is margin. It's pretty awesome. Uh, the problem is, or not the problem, but the thing that I was supposed to talk about following our financial piece sort of like curriculum is just like savings. 
And I think sometimes when we talk about only one thing, you, get, you, you miss the holistic view. And the other part is um, the Bible is written uh, from an agricultural perspective. So how many Aggies do I have here? Like you would text a and Where are you people at? Like that is the least awesome response I've ever gotten from an Aggie. Uh, like usually when I say text a and the whole place goes whoop, and it's really awkward and weird. All right, so... But the reality is the Bible was written in an agricultural world, like agriculture. So and whenever we talk about finances from the Bible, they're using stuff like vats of oil or wine or like your first fruits. And you're like, I have like an app that tells me where my money is. And I don't, that's all I know. I don't, that just does not compute. And so what I want to do this morning is we're going to talk about savings a, a little bit, but we're going to focus on a holistic picture. Uh, that kind of will help us understand from the agricultural background the Bible was written over 4,000 years ago to a contemporary mindset that kind of helps us understand well, how, how to employ our finances for the kingdom of God. Now, you take a look. There is your field. And so we're going to do everything in terms of field, and I'm going to make it somehow make sense in terms of income. But it's not just that we use our money to give, save, and live. There's something else that you guys may be familiar with especially on election season. Some of you guys don't have multi-million dollar tax shelters. Uh, you don't have to pay taxes, right? So uh, we're going to be giving. We're going to talk about uh, the, the tax aspect of stuff, living. And then plus, the one thing I didn't mention last week was margin. Like, where does that even fall in? So I think for a lot of us, I'm going to save all I can, live on the rest, pay off debt, and then if I have margin, then I can give to God at some point. And the big question that I always get with people is, um, Chris, do I, when I give, do I give off the gross or do I give off the net? And we're going to answer that question this morning as well. It's going to be pretty exciting for everybody to understand this. Okay, are you guys ready? Because I'm about to put you through some Bible drill. We are going to move through our Bibles at rapid speed. So if you don't have a Bible, this will be really good for you because you'll learn where page numbers and stuff are in probably the Bible that you usually have a phone. So in fact, if you have a paper Bible, this will be really fun because we're going to be doing some flipping. All right, if you don't have a Bible at all, this is our gift to you. Uh, if you don't have, yeah, so take it home, write your name in it, do all that. We are really pumped for this. Okay, so we're going to about to do some Bible drill, Bible surfing fun. Get ready. Here we go. First thing we're going to talk about is giving. All right, so when you talk about giving, you've got this big field. Where does our giving, how does that play into context? How does that contextually work with us? So I want to go to Proverbs chapter 3, where we're going to answer this question of like, what, do I give off the gross? Do I give off the net? How does it even work. You ready for this? Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6, and then 9 and 10. You guys, maybe for those of you who grew up in church, you know this verse. It's on a coffee cup somewhere or like on one of those plaques in your houses. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. And then verse 9. Now, this is the part, so like, you're going to trust in the Lord, uh, the God you cannot see, uh, because you have faith with your finances, with faith with everything, and your finances are part of that. And then honor the Lord. The Lord is honored by your wealth, with your wealth, and with the first fruits of all you produce. Then your barns, which all of us have barns in our backyard, I'm sure, will be filled with plenty. So I know you've got like your, you know, your, your grain, your hay, your sheep are all locked up in the barn in the backyard. And your vats will be bursting with wine. Okay, so like that's sort of where he takes you. And I want to give you this, this concept. So here it is. The very first thing that you do with your money, the first crops that you harvest goes to honor God. That answers the gross first the net question. The very first thing you take in, even before you pay taxes, goes to honor God. So the way that you compute that is you look at, you know, what they, you agreed with in your offer letter and your, wherever you're working, and then you go, from that, I'm going to give off that for the first fruits. Okay, that's a simple concept. And so it might look like, it might look like this in, in your field. So here's your first 10%. It goes to God. All right, so there's the first chunk of your field right away to God. Now, can I, just, can I just be real with you guys just for a second? Because not that I'm never not, but this is more transparent than I was planning on going. Uh, when I talk about money, there's always this part of me going, I'm going to offend everybody in the building. And there's going to be some non-Christian that's going to walk in. They'll be like, yep, told you. 
They just want to get into a building because they, you know, they don't like the gym and they're just going to use my money to buy some palace in the sky or they're going to do church. Okay, like I get it. Like, and that's sort of like my, if you're like that, then I'm feeling you. And every time people talk about money, I'm like, <gasps> like just terrified for all the non-Christians here. I, I just, that's how I went. And last night I had um, um, my neighbor uh, who's a atheist Jewish heritage woman and her two boys who are Muslim because her ex-husband is Muslim. Anyway, they came over uh, to carve pumpkins because that's what you do. And so we're carving pumpkins. She's, you know, she's asking about church. And I go, well, you know, I'm talking about money and it's always sort of, you know, an issue because I don't want to come off like a televangelist, you know, trying to raise money. She's like, no offense, but like that's the last thing anybody would think about you because you guys meet in a gym. I mean, that was kind of like her first. <laughs> and then she goes, but you guys believe in God, right? And, you know, this, you know she's atheist, non-Christian, thinks all of us are insane. And she goes, you guys believe, like, when, I, when she found out that we were evangelical Christians, she's like, oh, dear, oh, gosh, evangelical. I can't tell any of my friends that I'm friends with you. It'll go bad. All right. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I mean, you know, it's just challenging. She's like, but isn't that what you guys do? If you believe in God, you, like, give to God because you believe in it? And I was like, well, yeah. Right, of course. She's like, so you need to tell them they need to give. I'm like, all right, I'm like, you need to come with me. All right. Yeah. And so she was, what she was saying is like, if you really believe that there is a God just in the other side of visible, and he says, honor the Lord, because that's what you want to do with the first fruits, like the first bit of your income, then you should do that because you're Christians. I was like, yeah, I'm going to say that. So here I am saying that. And it was surprising to me that someone that has, like, negative understanding of, of the God we, I mean, she's heard, she heard the Jesus thing, and she's just like, oh, that's so cute, you and your made-up God. But it was amazing to me that she sort of understood the concept as a person who looks at us like complete idiots of, for what we believe in, says, of course you would give to that. Because that's the God who you believe designed you, and you, like, follow that book. I'm like, all right, good point. And, and, and listen, and here's the thing too. Um, if I were to like take polls of people who are believers here, Christians, and uh, I go, tell me a point in your life where you, you gave at a point where it seemed insane to give, we would all tell stories. We'd all have like these, like we'd probably start crying and stuff. It'd be really kind of odd. Because for those of us who, who believe this stuff and have, have put this regular habit of giving our first fruits to God, have seen him come through time and time again. Uh, I was, one of, one of the guys, first service, Trey Ford, he, he and I have known each other for about 10 years. And he was telling me about, um, as we were talking about what I was going to be preaching, he said, you know, when I was in my early 20s, I had just gotten divorced. I was working three jobs, and I was making next to nothing, and ramen noodles was a constant, you know, that was part of the dietary staple. And he said, I was one of the guys that the, that the church brought a turkey to, and I was, like, I was like, me, I'm the guy, really? And so I was, and he was telling me that story, and I was like, man. He went from a point, and he said, I was giving then. I wanted, I wanted to be faithful to God when I had nothing so that I could be faithful to God and trustworthy with his money when I had a lot. Because right now, if you, if you know Trey, his barns are full. Just check out his CrossFit gym in his garage. I mean, it's pretty awesome. His barns are full, and his vats are bursting with wine. Because God could trust him when he had a little. And God could trust him now when he has a lot. Now I want you to hear this. This is, this is the book of Proverbs that we're talking about. So like whenever you see Proverbs, it's not the book of promises. Did you know that? That might be a weird thing to talk about. But this is a proverb, which means a thing that's generally true. Generally true. Like when you give to God, uh, when you honor God with your first fruits, he's actually honored by that and he is your father. And so therefore he takes care of you. But it's not quid pro quo, right? It's not like a guarantee. I gave God my money. I'm waiting for my Bentley. I mean, it's not like that. Uh, and, you know, if, so if you're waiting for the jet plane, uh, because that's sort of what you felt like God promised you in, in you know, your revelation of, like, the book of notes, I mean, like, I think that you're going to find yourself disappointed, okay? But the reality is this is a principle that's generally true about giving. And so I wanted you to kind of just kind of that, that grasp, the understanding. Because right now, for some of you, you're saying, for me to give, Chris, that's crazy. 
For me to give right now with the situation I'm in right now is crazy. But I'm telling you, when you honor God with the very first what you have, I promise you, you won't regret it. I pro- I've never met somebody who's like, you know, I just gave God too much of my money. That's what, that's what put me into poverty. You know, like, I'm just not taken care of. I have not met that guy yet. I haven't met him. Like, I would love to meet that guy. I'd be like, wow, God's not faithful. Thank you for telling me that. But I haven't met him yet. I just haven't met that guy or girl. I just haven't met him. And so I want you to see that like, you could trust God with your first fruit, and it's honoring to him. Okay, so we get that. And we said that it's about 10% is what in the general. But I don't want you to say like 10% my hard, fast. I want you to start with 8%. Put giving, if you've never given before, let's start with two, three, four, five. Start somewhere. And then let's see what God does with that so that later on you can give 10, 11, 12, 15, 20, 25, 30. Because when your vats start overflowing, you want to give back to the God who gave you so much. Okay, here we go. The next thing that's always fun to talk about is taxes, right? We all love taxes because that's super fun. And so... um, you get your taxes taken from you whether you wanted that to happen or not, right? Like it's just like, and it's gone. Like nobody gets to choose that. That just sort of happens. And that's kind of what I'm hoping happens with our giving and because we, we kind of apply it like we do taxes because we give off the gross, not the net. So our taxes come. Why do we pay taxes? Well, in a world when the Bible was written, we're talking like you know, 4,000 plus years ago, it was written in the world of theocracy. Do you guys know what I mean when I say theocracy? That means like God was king. And all the people, when they paid their taxes, the taxes went to God. So it was kind of like you didn't feel quite as bad when the taxes went up because you were still giving it to God. And you're like, well, God's in control. Uh, and not that God's not in control now. So hear that too. So he, the people would give taxes. And, and it was part of what they did. They had to pay for, pay for government employees, which were uh, the Levites. So turn to page 127 in your Bible. And we're going to go there. All right, here we go. Numbers 18, 21, 22, to the Levites. Uh, you could call that church staff. You could also call that government workers because they, they did both jobs. To the Levites I have given every tithe in Israel for an inheritance, meaning they don't have land that they inherited. They couldn't raise crops, and so they depended on the people's giving. In return for their service that they do, their service in the tent of meeting, so the people of Israel do not come near the tent of meeting lest they bear sin and die. So, so that the people would not be involved in the ritualistic things that were only for Levites. They paid them to do the work. Okay, so the first, there was a tenth. There was a tenth that went to the Levites. Okay, so then there's another tenth that goes to national feast. Now, this, the feasting thing is just such a cool thing. Go to 158. I, Deuteronomy chapter 14. Uh, I love this because this is such a, a fun thing when it comes to tithing. Because I'm going to blow your mind with these national feasts. You shall tithe all the yield. This is verse 22. You shall tithe all the yield of your seed that comes from the field year by year. So every year you take a tenth, another tenth of your field. And before the Lord your God in the place that he will choose, you will make his name dwell there. You shall eat the tithe of your grain of your wine. So what he's saying is like, Whenever you guys go to the promised land, this is Moses writing this down. Hey, we're about to go into the promised land. We've hung out for 40 years. We're about to go into the promised land. When we go there, every year we're going to get together for a big party. Um, Think Lollapalooza. Uh, Yeah, you can think Lollapalooza, and I'll tell you why in a sec. All right, so everyone's get together for a big party. It's going to be a big festival, a big feast, lots of music, lots of partying. And before the Lord your God, in the place that he will dwell, only it's before God. And the firstborn of your herd and the flock, you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. Now, the best part of this feast was, watch, this is kind of fun. Verse 24, if the way is too long for you, so you're living really far away from where the the tent of meeting or the temple is, so that you're not able to carry the tithe because the place is too far from you, you shall turn it into money. So like, take all your grain, take your sheep, sell it, convert it to cash, and take it with you and spend the money for whatever you desire. The whole tent, oxen or sheep, or wine or strong drink. I know if you're Baptist, it's going to make you, you know, kind of, you're like, I don't know, I don't know. Strong drink translated sweet beer, all right? So, like, this is the place to party, all right? Whatever your appetite craves, and you shall eat there before the Lord your God and rejoice. Awkward for a lot of people who grew up 
that that verse was never taught. Okay, so what he's saying is we're going to have some sweet parties and you guys got to fund it because the feast time is not a time to go, don't go light on the beer, don't go light on the sheep and the oxen and the food. We're going to make this party like no one's ever party because we have a God that is bigger than any other person. So we will party at the best parties. And so 10% of your income goes to funding the national party. Huh? Yeah. All right, there you go. That was, I, when I read that, I was like, man, I got to preach this one. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> all right, next one is going to be uh, benevolence. 3.3% uh, was supposed to be given uh, to benevolence. So verse 28, 29, at the end of every three years, you shall bring out the tithe of your produce in the same year and lay it up within your towns. And the Levite, because he has no portion of the adherence with you, and the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow who are within your town shall come and eat and be filled, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands that they do, that you do. And so here's this thing that, that taxes were a part of this. Now, remember, church and state were one big combo because it was a theocracy. We got that, right? Uh, but look at how much of, of the finances went off the top. So you got your initial 10%. Now, some people might debate this. That then, that 10% that we just talked about in Deuteronomy to the Levites was the first fruits. And so people debate that. And I don't want to get into a theological discussion on that. But anywhere from 13.3 to 23.3% yearly went to pay for taxes, for feasts, and for roads, and for stuff, and for clergy, and for clerks, and for law, and courts, and police, and all that stuff. All that stuff. It's ironically, 4,000 years ago, sort of the same tax system is in place, because roughly everyone's paying around 20% more for some, less for others, and that's how you roll. Isn't that, isn't that interesting that this long later, we're still paying about the same percentage? Now, if you go to Europe, it's a little bit more, but we won't talk about that. All right. Now, the next thing we're going to talk about is then, is so you've kind of laid down this foundation, is before taxes are taken out, this is how your, your life should look like. And then after taxes, let's talk about that. There's this thing of saving, right? We, we, got, we have to save. Uh, and so this is where I was, as I was looking through the scripture this week, I was like, all right, what percentage? I was like looking for it. And it doesn't give us a percentage. It just gives us like a principle. Watch this. Go to um, Proverbs 21, uh, page 543, verse 20. Twenty-one twenty, precious treasure. Now, treasure in an agrarian age is like my sweet donkeys, sheep, goats, oxen, or could be metal bars, which are gold or silver. Precious treasure and oil. Oil is what you use to cook with. Oil is what you use to, to heal with. Oil is used for a lot of different things. Precious treasure and oil are in a wise man's dwelling. I want you to highlight, underline, wise. Smart people, not rich people, because we're all, everybody in here is rich. You wouldn't think you're rich, but if you're like globally, you're rich. If you're sitting in here and you somehow drove here, then you're rich. Precious treasure and oil are in a wise man's dwelling, but a foolish man devours it. In other words, a lot of us are eating our treasure that we should be storing up. Now, why, why is it important to save? This is, this is where, like, remember, the whole lesson was supposed to be on this one particular principle. Why is it important to save? It is important to save um, because, because eight out of ten of us, this is, uh, you know, Money Magazine say eight out of ten families. So, like, pick a row. About, uh, right there, that row. Pretend each one of you guys is a family. Eight out of ten. So you kind of look down. Eight of us are going to go through a financial crisis of roughly six to $10,000 within 10 years. Okay? Here's how I know this. How many of you guys have, have, an, have an AC unit in your house? Good. That's good. Almost all of us. <laughs> okay? It's going to break down. Your AC is not immortal. It's not. Like, it won't last forever. I know, like, for some of you, you're like, I'm just trusting the Lord and miraculous things. This thing is designed to eventually break down. Maybe if you had a train, it's going to last maybe a little bit longer. Maybe you're the two. You know, eight out of ten. There's always those two people who are just like, gosh, always, they're always got a blessing. 
Like, we understand those people. All right, so, but eight out of ten of us are going to go through some sort of financial crisis. Someone's going to lose their job, and you go through five to six months. You're like, I don't know, I don't know. It's going to come through then, but for, there's going to be a, a financial crisis. Somebody's going to have a kid get sick. Sickness will come, and you'll finance your, your foot, leg. You'll, you'll, you'll do whatever it takes to make sure that your kid's okay. You're not going to just go like, well, put it on the card, because it's your kid. Every one of us is going to go through some sort of financial crisis. But for a lot of us, we're Starbucksing it. We're eating it. We're eating the crisis now. And again, I don't want to get us to this place where we're looking at, you know, hoarding, right? Where, you know, this is not, your trust is in God. But the reason why this has become so important, and I want you to hear me, is the, the, one of the main reasons why was, this makes you nervous is when, when you see this verse, it's on page 993, is 1 Timothy 5. If anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially the members of his own house, he has denied the faith, denied the faith, and is worse than an unbeliever. If you don't provide for your family, you are worse than an unbeliever. Now that's the part where you're just like, okay, everyone be... <laughs> Awkward silence, everyone just kind of shuffles, look at your feet, that kind of thing. I get it. Like that, because listen, if you're not being able to provide for your family, you know, it, listen, it is like just law of average is going to kick in. Eight out of ten of you are going to experience a, some sort of financial crisis in the next, within the ten year span. Every ten years, just think we're going to have one of those six to ten thousand dollar crises. And if you're not prepared for it, then someone's going to pay for it. And the last person I want to pay for it is your children. And here's what I want you to learn. Here's what I want you to learn. Our children will learn how to save and be responsible by watching you. Now, hear me, hear me. A lot of us did not have parents who grew up saying like, and now we're going to give to God, and now we're going to save, and now we're going to live off the rest. I understand a lot of you did not grow up like that. And so the reason why you live paycheck to paycheck is you never had ever thought of not doing that because that's all you've known. That's all you've seen. We spend it all. In fact, we go beyond our limit because... We just need what we need. And so what I want you to see is, and Dave Ramsey will, will say this. He'll say, after taxes, pay yourself first. And I want to put it this way. Pay your family first. And I get it. For me, like, listen, I, especially when it comes to eating out, this has been, you know, this is the part where I struggle a little bit because I'm an eat out guy. Like, my mom uh, and I, well, this is sort of for free, I guess. But my mom and I, growing up, like, my dad wasn't around very much. So it was like, instead of, like, eating, you know, making dinner for two, which is always not super exciting, unless you're, like, dating, uh, you, we would go to McDonald's, like, a lot. Like, a lot. And so, like, that's just what I did. Like, I, I, have, I have a deep affinity for McDonald's. I'm one of those marketed to people. Like, I just love McDonald's. In fact, I still remember, um, okay, so this is part of why we do church the way we do, just because of McDonald's. Okay, you ready? So, um, when I was younger, my mom and I went to McDonald's. It was like Mother's Day, okay? And when I walked in the door, they handed out flowers to every mom. And I was like, Mom, McDonald's, don't they do it right? <laughs> every time I go, anytime my mom and I go to McDonald's now, we go, they do it right. And so the reason why you get flowers on Mother's Day, McDonald's, thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> So, so there's this, just this reality that we, there's this tendency in us because the way we were raised that we just are been trained and how we're like eating out or Starbucks, those are just things that I need. And what I'm saying is instead of eating it, I want you to save it. I want you to put a little bit away. And, you know, I made up a percentage here because the Bible doesn't give you a percentage. It's like 10, 10%. Let's just do that. Put, pick a percentage. The Bible doesn't give you a specific percentage to save. But what it does say is save. Wise people take money and they don't eat it, they save it. Your trust isn't in your money, your trust is in God. But you know, straight up statistically, that God's going to provide you opportunities to teach your children how to save by providing for them in a crisis. This is God's gift to us crisis. Thank you, Jesus. Okay. 
So then, after we've, we got, now we're down to about anywhere from 33 to 43%, right? Now we're going to get on the rest. And I want us to live. Okay, so how are we supposed to live? And I wanted you guys to sort of see kind of God's view. Like, he's not wanting us to, um, to never take vacation. That's not it. He just wants us to be smart. And I want you to see kind of like his emphasis on being smart. Smart, 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 smart. Here we go. Proverbs 21, verse 16 on page 543. Proverbs 21, 543, verse 16. One who wanders away, wanders from the way of good sense. So one who is not smart will rest in the assembly of the dead. Bad place. Don't hang out there. Traffic's terrible and it's just not fun. Whoever loves pleasure will be a poor man. I have a seafood you know, diet. I see food. I eat it. I have, a, you know, I have a sea coffee diet. I see coffee. I drink it. I have to have what I want when I want when I, when I want it because my heart just is leading me that way. And, you know, there is something on sale in the domain. And so, therefore, that was never going to be available ever again. I had to have it right then. He who loves wine and oil will not be rich. Okay. Whoever loves pleasure will be a poor man. Whoever loves wine and oil will not be rich. If you consume it, you won't be able to save it. And so what he's saying here is save. Okay, then the second piece of this, the way you live, it shouldn't be like, okay, Disneyland's not off limits. Are you with me? Like, like we, can, we can have fun. Like, God has blessed you. You don't have to live like an African just because you, you know, we have a global perspective, right? God has given you uh, an abundance probably because of the way that you've worked and he wants to enjoy it. And then guess what? He commands you to. There's nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. Because life is hard. I saw, th- this also I saw is from the hand of God. God actually wants you to enjoy yourself. Did you know that? Like God's not just like a taskmaster being like, no, rice cakes again. Ramen noodle is what you're going to eat for dinner. Like, no, he's saying enjoy yourself, but don't eat your savings. Enjoy it. Experience it. This is where I feel like a lot of us get hung up because we, we, don't, we don't understand the difference. We live in this world of consumer-based living, and we, and we understand that that's part of I feel it, and so I do it. But then on the flip side, we have a, a saving kind of concept, and so that's such a hard thing. And God wants us to kind of be a moderate with that, and he wants us to enjoy what we have. That's why you have free spirit people, because they're like, you have to have some sort of a life. We don't just sit in dark rooms and pray all day long, right? We don't do that. We use electricity. We use AC. We enjoy our life until it breaks down. And then we call Jeff Knight, and he saves the day. All right, so here it is. Here's your percentages. 10% right off the top, off the gross, not the net. You're giving, up, you're giving to the government off the gross, not the net. Didn't know if you knew that or not. And then you give your 10%, you're going to save, and then you're going to live off the rest. And there's this last part that we call margin. Now, margin, what, this is the part of the whole, this is the whole name of the series. In this margin part, is actually in Scripture. Now, this is the part that I was really excited about, and I wanted to preach a whole sermon on it, and, but it's, it's kind of a unique passage that I wanted to show you of what you're supposed to do and why you're supposed to leave a little bit at the end. Look at this, because we're talking about crops and stuff. Go, back, go to page um, 97. I know very rarely do we preach out of the 90s in our Bibles, but that's in uh, Leviticus. Huh? You guys had some sweet devotional time here. When you reap the harvest of your land, because we are agricultural society, okay, you shall not reap your field right up to the edge. Translation, have margin of your field. Neither shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. So when you drop stuff, leave it on the ground. Why? Like what's wrong with a couple, you know, picking up a penny? And you shall not strip your vineyard bare. In other words, don't pick every grape. Neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. Why? You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. Now, this part to me was really cool. 
This is built-in margin in fields. Now, I've, I've mentioned this before. When I was uh, in seminary, I was a sojourner, which is just a fun way of saying traveling speaker guy. Uh, and so, and I wrote a book. And so when you, you were at like big churches everywhere, you would need a men's retreat speaker. And so you'd call somebody that wasn't me. And then after he said no, you'd call somebody else who wasn't me either. And then like on your third round of like, oh, there's nobody else who will do it. Who do you call? You call me. And I'd show up with a trunk full of books and hoping that I would talk well enough. And then you would be like, wow, that was so amazing. I'll buy his book that you would never read, but at least you'd buy it. And so that was sort of my plan to get through seminary. Okay, so that was who I was. And so um, I had a friend of mine uh, in seminary, lived in Dallas area, and he uh, was not a sojourner. He was a corporate, amazing, superstar guy. And we had lunch one day, and he says, hey, can I have some of your books? And I was like, oh, somebody wants my books. It was really exciting. So I had a whole trunk full of them, so it was not a hard thing. So I went over, and I, you know, I gave him, like, I was like, you know what, take a box. To give, you know, tell a friend, you know, one of those moments. And then he he planned this out. He gave me like an envelope of cash in it. I was like, oh, thanks. And I was, you know, it was sort sort of thicker. I thought it might be, you know, hundred dollars on the high end or like you know ten ones. You know, I didn't know. And so I, I put it in my pocket, and I get back into my car, and I and you know after we had lunch, the whole thing, which he paid for, I was really grateful for that. And uh, and I get in my car and I open it up, and it's hundred dollar bill, hundred dollar bill, hundred dollar bill, thousand dollars. And I'm like, da, 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 da. and I'm doing a day. I'm like, a, yeah, what's up? I got a thousand dollars, and it was like great, glorious, like yes, like this guy out of. I mean, like it's, it's not like his kids were going hungry because he was giving me a thousand dollars, right? I mean, like they, he was, they was, they were fine. But out of his margin, he helped a guy out that was like, you know, I'm your traveling book salesman, and nobody wants my books. Which is why you get them for free now. No, um, just kidding. All right, that was <laughs> all right. So, so what happened was, is like I was like that. That was just ingrained in my brain. All right, it was ingrained in my brain. And recently, uh, a couple months ago, um, uh, I had a friend come up, and he's like, "Hey, um, hey, do you think the church could help me out with some money?" And I was like, "Well, how much do you need?" He's like, "I need a thousand dollars." And I was like. You know, it just, for some reason, just clicked for me back when uh, I got that. I did the happy dance. And I was like, this is my opportunity. I mean, this is like a perfect deal. I could pay, not to get cheesy, but pay it forward, right? And so I got home to Adrian. I said, hey, let's, let's take some of our margin and let's give it kind of as remembrance of what God did back in the day for me. So we were able to raise $1,000. Now, I didn't do it in like the ATM style. I wrote a check, but it was the same effect. <laughs> and it was like one of those times where I got courtside tickets to the finals. And I get to see God working. I mean, you know, you know like everyone wants tickets to the finals so that, you know, the players can sweat on you. And maybe LeBron James falls in your lap as he goes and, you know, throws the ball back in. But I got to see God working up close and personal. You know what? Listen, as a pastor, I get to kind of see this more than just when I do it. Because I, you know, someone's like, hey, I got to, like, pay for seven people's stuff for the women's retreat. And I'm like, okay, you know, like, and they're not even going. See, that happens over and over and over again. And people do little happy dances internally and sometimes externally, depending on the personality. And they're like, you get to watch what God does with your margin. But here's the problem. If you don't have margin, you don't get to experience that. The, the reason why I get excited about this, don't you want to be in the front row where God's doing something using you? Don't you want to be that guy? Because a lot of us, we're just like, I just need another thousand. I want you to go from the guy being a, needing a thousand to the guy giving a thousand. This is why you are blessed to be a blessing. You are going to be blessed to be a blessing. And this is where I don't want to get to, you know, televangelist on you, but it's true. Like God is faithful. You can trust him with your money. And when you start looking at people with Jesus glasses on, you start to see like, there's some people in need. And I can, I can be a blessing to them in their lives and watch God work. And it happens all the time at this church because we got some generous people here. And I'm so grateful to be a part of this. But I want you to I want you to have this scheduled in. I want this to be 
I'm going to call this 1% to 5% down here. I'm going to call it your ministry slush fund, okay? Like, I want you to be thinking of, like, how is God going to use what I can do with the people that surround me so I can be on the front row to watch God work? But listen, if you're not giving in the first place, if you're, not, if you're not paying your taxes, if you're not paying your family first, and if you're living in such a way where you consume it all, then what I'm talking about is irrelevant. But, but, but listen to me, listen to me. We are a family of believers, meaning we believe that there's a God in heaven just on the other side of visible. And he sent his son. He gave his son to die on the cross for our sins, and he rose from the dead. And our hope is not on anything in this world. That's why when the elections come, you're just like, who do I choose? doesn't matter. You want to know why? Our king is still on the throne. That doesn't change a thing. And so our hope isn't in some governmental plan. It isn't in health care or repealing health care or whatever your view on health care is. Because he is our God and our trust is in him, not in stuff or people. You hear me? But when we live our lives out of fear or greed, we come to a place where all that stuff has to matter because this is all you got. And so my hope for this morning is that we would learn to live our lives like this. That we would, first thing that would happen is just be automatic out of your account. You're like, I'm giving because that's what God calls me to do and I want to honor him first. And then you pay taxes because that's what we do and you, don't, you probably don't have a tr tax shelter, trust fund or something. That, you know, we just do that because we're the normal people. And then ultimately I want you to, uh, I want you to put God first by paying your family first. Then the creditors. <laughs> And then saving up to a point where you can take care of emergencies because you've been listening to God's word on how to be wise. And then having margin so that in the moments where there's a need, you can be like, watch God do this. Front row, court side, watching God do his thing watching people do a happy dance because they saw God intervene. They were praying, like, who's going to answer this prayer? Some person has to answer the prayer. God works through his people. God works through a family of believers committed to reaching people with a life-changing reality of Jesus Christ. And it's real and it's powerful and it's happening. And so my hope and my cry is this, that if you're not a Christian here today, you'd say like, I don't even believe that's how you, that, that you're God or something, but I believe that I've seen so many people follow this design, the system, you just jump in on it and you'd be like, I'll give it a shot. I just haven't had one person say, you know, when I honored God with my money, he never honored me. I just pretty much was screwed over, over and over by God. Never heard that. I haven't had that. I've never met that person. Don't know who that is. But my heart's cry is that you would just say, like, you know what? There is something that's more than this. I can't see it, but I can feel it. I can't see it, but I see it in you. And I want it. And you would receive that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and he rose from the dead. And you live your life like this. You'd give, you'd pay taxes, you'd save, you'd live, and then you have margin for those special moments. And for those of us who are Christians, I pray that that's what we do because that's who we are. That's what Christians do. And so my neighbor, Catherine, would go, yeah, of course you guys would do that because that's who you are. Your identity is some crazy God that I think's made up, but you believe it. And I know you're real and I know you're legit because the way that your finances follow your faith because there's a God that you believe in that I cannot see. I wish I could. I wish it was real, but I don't know. And my heart's cry for Catherine is that she would see me, would see my life, hear, see, and then respond to the gospel because she heard it from my lips and saw it in my life. Would you pray with me? Father, uh, this morning, uh, we get to worship you. We get to sing the songs. We get to uh, cry out your name as above all names. And God, my prayer and my heart's cry is that our finances would follow those songs. That as we sing to the God we cannot see, our finances would be directed by the God we could not see. 
And Lord, that there be a tangible expression of the invisible kingdom that we could just watch how you have blessed us. We can watch the blessing in others because we are the kingdom of God and we're advancing steadily on this kingdom of darkness and we're pushing it back, Father, with your power and your grace and your mercy because we live out this truth that we were once dead in our sins and we're now alive in you. And so, Father, I'm praying that somebody here would experience that life change for the very first time. And they would say, I want you, Jesus. I don't know how this whole thing works, but I'm turning my life and my will and my money over to you. I'll do it however you want because you're my God and you're my king. And Father, for those of us who do know you, will we walk in spirit, we walk in truth, following our hearts towards you wholeheartedly, holistically, with every ounce of us, including our finances. We love you, God. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Imagine for a moment the anxiety level going down because you gave God control of all your finances. Imagine no longer sitting there going, how are we going to make it? But instead of like, how can I help somebody else make it? Imagine being able to show the world what it looks like to have Christ at the center, to trust him wholeheartedly and make a difference in the lives of people because you simply got your money to work the way God designed it. To give, to pay taxes, to live, or to save, to live, and to have margin. The darkness will be pushed back and then hell's grasp and hold will no longer be so strong because heaven's light will be pushing through you and the power that we're seeing. Would you receive the benediction? Go. And be blessed to be a blessing. Go and push back the darkness that kind of creeps in with not having any savings, that creeps on the stress levels, the arguments, and the frustration. Go and put that stuff aside as you trust him saying, God, you've got it. Push back that darkness and have an awesome week of worship. You're just